There's lots of fantastic looking games on Kickstarter. But should Rogue Angels be on your space radar? Hi, I'm Libby. And I'm Julian, and we are from the YouTube channel of Boxed Meeples. We've been sent a prototype of the new game Rogue Angels by designer Emil Larsen. Now this is a space-based dungeon crawler. And over the course of this game, you're going to be playing 40 of 70 different potential missions. It's a legacy game, but it's a character progression legacy. But one of the reasons I'm very excited about this is because it's based on the designer's experience playing video games, particularly games like Mass Effect and various other tactical RPGs. So, Julian has quite a strong background in video gaming. You've reviewed quite a lot. You've written a book about some point and clicks, all sorts of bits and pieces, and you've played a lot and of video you've, games. You've, I don't think you've had heard of Mass Effect until we started talking about this I game. I mean, I knew the name. <laughs> Um, I, you know, I, when it comes to video games, I played Street Fighter with the bashy button technique. Um, yeah, that's, that's yeah, well, probably I, I've, about it. I've, I've <laughs> often talked about how many video games I've played. Obviously, I've spent the last probably 30 years of my life playing video games, and I'm, I'm quite new to board games. So what we thought we'd do is we'd come at it from different angles. I'm going to be talking about Rogue Angels and why this is going to be particularly exciting for video game players. And I'm just going to be talking about people that love a tabletop game. So we're going to come up with five reasons between us as to why we both are excited about this game. Now I think one of the most exciting features of Rogue Angels is the cooldown track. Now if you played any sort of RPG style video game, particularly Mass Effect, you'll know that in those games you can often do small quick actions or you can do longer actions. But if you do a longer action, it's going to take longer for it to be available again to you and uh, to use again. Whereas if you use a quick action, like a quicker attack, you can do lots of small quick ones, but they're not going to do much damage. That's been translated into this game using this cooldown track in a fantastic way. So basically you have a hand of cards, I, I believe there's seven for each different character choice that you have, which will give you those different choices. So each character has two cards which have a zero value, so you'd be able to play them on the cooldown track in the zero spot, which means they come straight back into your hand to be able to play again whenever you like. But any of the more skilled attacks you would have to place depending on their value on the card in the slots one, two, three, or four. And then as you finish your turn, you rest, so everything moves down slightly. So that's a great decision to be made as to when do I play those expensive cards and am I ready to not have it in my hand to use later? Do I use a quick one and be able to do that action again? And that choice is really exciting to me. Yeah, I think what's clever about it is that you, if you have a card like armor, you can play that higher up the track and that means you're going to enjoy it for longer, you're going to get that benefit for longer. But then what that does mean is as it moves down, it's blocked up those spaces that you might need for that turn. So you might then want to play something of value two as your armour has moved into two and you're going to have to then play that at three and wait even longer than you would have to before it's, it comes back to you. It's one of those things where you just go, why have I not seen that in another similar game? We're so used to in gaming just tapping the card once you've used it and then having to wait to the next round before it's freed itself up again for you to be able to use it again. But having this decision where you can choose when to use it, how long you're going to be out of play for that particular card and having an array of these skills I think is really exciting. Also when you get a wound guess where that's going to go? That's going to go slap bang in your cooldown track which is really clever because it works those systems together. If you end up with a whole cooldown track full of wounds and there's nowhere to place that a new wound you're unconscious you're out of this game. And um, guess who didn't come and save no. me? No so it's, it's, all, it's, it's such a clever way of balancing how much risk are you going to take? If you start getting wounded too early on, you're going to have no spaces to do anything. So I had a card, Battle Cry, which I could play at the top of the track and use its effects all the way through. But for me to use that card required me to use a shield. So then once we get a little bit further into the mission and I start getting attacked and those shields are just dropping, 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 and then a couple of wound cards come in, all of a sudden I'm thinking, oh gosh, should I have used the Battle Cry? Yeah. <laughs> I'm now unconscious. and. You haven't saved me. No, I haven't. <laughs> now, what you can do is you can play two cards on your turn or you can relax, you can rest. And what that does, it moves everything down on your track. 
which means you can get the cards you desperately need back in your hand, but you've kind of got to stand like a lemon while you do that. Uh, it's just a very intuitive, clever system. So when you account your experience playing the game Mass Effect, you probably talk about who your shepherd was. Was it a male shepherd? Was it a female shepherd? Were they a renegade? Were they a paragon? That character development was kind of key to that video game and it's been replicated wonderfully in Rogue Angels. It starts off with which character you're going to play. There's a selection of 20. 20 I believe there will be. Um, we obviously had less in our prototype version um, but from what we've seen there's 20 different characters they've all got different types different genders some of them are fluid some of them are human some of them are aliens so there's kind of a choice for everyone yeah see after picking who you're going to be as you progress through the game you're given those moral choices and this usually comes in a form of literally called cutscenes which would be a term familiar to video game fans where you, often you have, are you going to do this or are you going to do this? On the dial for each character there is this section with four different personality traits. So as you fill in elements of your personality you might for example become more domineering. So you'll take more aggressive actions and you'll be able to use your cards to match up with those. So I played the character Hero who is a Terran kind of commando really. Um, and he has power armour, he has a power armour card. So I could use one of those tokens to add an extra two damage to an adjacent enemy every time I play this card. But I could only do that if I've upgraded him to become a domineering character. If I'd chosen to make him into a different sort of character, I wouldn't have had that action, but I would have had a different action I could use on a different card. It's all those things together that I think combine to make you actually end up caring about your characters. Often you play a kind of dungeon crawler and you talk about how, you know, that how the character reflects you or, or the actions they've taken. Hopefully when you play this game you'll sculpt them into a character that either reflects you or reflects who you'd like them to be and you end up choosing is this what they would do or is this what I would do and there's a big distinction between those. Yeah when we played I mean probably because of poor play but we ended up not completing the missions but just gunning everyone down at one mission. Because that's and, what our characters would do that's yeah. that seemed like their, and so, their style. At the end of the mission, when we had a choice whether we were to keep somebody alive or not, there was that kind of, oh, what would I do? But actually, is that what our characters have done, given what they've just been doing? And then as the legacy evolves, I'm sure that those sort of progress through and all the decisions become more your character and less you as a player. And I think it's characteristics like this that have give this game longevity, because then you can play it again play different characters, make entirely different decisions and then see where you end up at the end of the campaign. One of the things that I really like in this game, which has been seen in a few other games of recent times, is that the maps are in that book-based thing. So if you've played Gloomhaven, Jaws of the Lion, Sleeping Gods, um, several other games that have this book and you can just literally open it up and there's your game board done. And that's so easy to play. It also means that as the missions progress, and if anything happens, if you change location, you can just flip the page, pop your people on, and you're ready to go. I'm a big fan of the books. I mean, we've gone through Imperial Assault, and the person who's running the game for us used to have to start an hour and a half beforehand just to find all the pieces and set up the board for us. Having a book means you're ready to go more or less immediately. What's particularly exciting about this game is that as you play through the missions, they themselves evolve. So what you might put on the table in the book to start off with won't necessarily be what you finish on. For example, we had a choice partway through the mission. Are we going to be stealthy and sneak through, avoiding the enemies, get to computer, hack those to complete the mission? Which is what I wanted to do, but or, someone didn't follow the commander's instructions. Are we just going to bumble through, set off all the alarms and then have to gun our way out? As a result of our faux pas in that mission, <laughs> and because of certain troops not paying attention to their commander, the mission that followed, the next phase of that mission, was different. So in the next phase we had less time and a much more difficult mission because we did so badly in the previous one. And to balance it out, on the third phase of that mission we had a slightly easier one. But what was interesting was that we flicked through and saw the different alternatives, was that on the same map, the outcomes were different and, in and importantly halfway through we had to make a moral decision. Are we going to save someone or are we going to kill someone? Now we made the what we thought was the obvious choice <laughs> but what's great about this game is it subverts those ideas you know the, the 
the more cliched ideas aren't necessarily the right decisions. Uh, then what followed was a mad dash because of our decision making. Now we've only played a limited selection of missions, but if they evolve in this throughout the game, that's incredibly exciting because it's going to make it unpredictable. You're looking at a map and then make a decision. Suddenly the map you've been staring at won't necessarily be what you're expecting. You might plan out several routes through it across many, many turns and then suddenly, boom, half the maps change and your plan's gone kaput and you've got to start thinking on your feet. And it's clever how intuitive and how accessible the game is to allow you to change mission tactics literally part way through the mission on an entirely different set of parameters. And what's great about the maps is for me, they just remind me of those slightly older top-down space games used to play, maybe on the Amiga, games like, I'm thinking like Alien Breed. And the game as a whole looks fantastic. The art in it is incredible. And it's clearly harking back to the ideas of Mass Effect without copying them. It's gone in its own clever directions. I think it's actually set in a world based around a slightly different video game that Emil Larson also really enjoyed that his previous game was based on. So it has its own, own world that's already been created and the, some of the characters look amazing and I think that adds to that ability to connect to your character and, and create sort of a bond with it as you're playing with it, especially as it's a legacy game. I think you really need the artwork to work for you and connect with you. Yeah, it, it's a because it's a legacy game where it's based on character development and, and story in a way, this would be awful if the stories were bad, but the stuff we've seen so far is incredibly well written. Yeah. It feels like reading a, a really good science fiction novel. It's, it's those little attention to details that I think elevate this game above so many other ones we've played set in kind of more generic space universes. And I love the way you get the choices and it does make something different happen depending on what you choose. And I'm sure, you know, as a designer, there'll be funnels in and then stories coming out again. Otherwise, it's just going to be unwieldy. Um, but it does feel like the choices you make make a difference to what's going to happen next. And that's have, really exciting. I think it's important that you do, because if there's no consequence to your decisions, there'd be no jeopardy, there'd be no tension. You'd just be choosing something and going, well, it doesn't really matter. In this game, it really does. And we know certain characters aren't going to make it through to the end. We've already seen that. So when are they going to go? How are they going to die? And will it make a difference to your characters if they do or not? How will that affect their character and personality? It does give you those really tough decisions, but it isn't tough to learn. It, the rules aren't complicated. So we've talked about a lot of mechanisms within the game, but don't be fooled thinking there's a really complicated, chunky rule book. It's actually quite intuitive and simple ideas about how you actually play. Really easy to pick up, like we had no problems in our first mission just working out how the play worked out. I think the first mission acts like a tutorial, which would be, again, yeah. familiar to video game plans. It teaches you this is how you move, then teaches you this is how you fight, then teaches you this is how you interact. And there's so many bits in the game that are just interwoven so you're not doing a different action, a different set of routines to open a door or access a computer. You're doing essentially a mini game, which would be, again, familiar to video game players. So as a board gamer, I'm really not that keen on just roll the dice, have I died, have I shot them, win or lose on a dice roll. This game's a little bit different. You're, whenever you're interacting with something, which would include opening doors, hacking computers, all sorts of things that you'll have to do throughout the game, Instead of rolling those dice, what you're doing is picking tokens from a bag. Now, depending on which card you've used might depend on how many tokens you're able to pull out. Um, but in the bag, there's three different colors and then some whites which add as a wild card. And you need three of the same color, or two of one and one wild card, to be able to complete that interaction. It was really exciting when we played. We, we, we were chanting going, okay, Red, 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 because we had two there. Like football hooligans. <laughs> but if you, we knew that there's two there, but there's also a white. We had a choice. Are you going to pull out a white, destroy all your hard work? Are you going to stop there and keep the two for the next turn? Or are you going to gloriously pull out a red, hack that computer and save the mission? It was, it was pretty darn exciting stuff. Yeah, it was exciting. And, and I prefer it to the dice roll. Now, there is dice rolling in this game, but I feel like it's always to your benefit. You use your cards to do a certain action. Many of those cards include a dice roll. 
and that might give you an extra shield it might let you move a bit further it might let you add a certain number to the action you're doing so that could be damage to an enemy it could be the movement still um, and so the dice rolling you're doing is always giving you a bonus and of course you're planning and hoping that you're going to get a good bonus but you never have that feeling of roll ugh, I've completely failed because you're working from your base of I know I can do this much if nothing else. At worst your, your dice roll is going to be not what you planned but still something good. You might end up getting a shield and going oh now I've got a shield it's going, I, that's really useful because I've run out of those that's going to save me from future attack but I really need a plus two because if I do I'm going to be able to do this action better. And there, you also have a focus track which if you do roll something horrendous and that you really don't need, then you do have the choice to re-roll that dice as well. But obviously you have a finite number of fo focus. And, and the amount of focus you have really depends on characters. So essentially, some of the characters are just basically more lucky because then you can have more luck mitigation. You can keep re-rolling until you get the result you want, until you get the result you need. And others don't have that at all. No, <laughs> others are just not <laughs> lucky and have no ability to work that out. But, we all know there's nothing worse than you failing a mission down due to one dice roll on the last turn and you're going great we failed that and it's through no fault of our own and we've had that happen to us in previous games and and i think that's you know partly contributed to why i'm not a massive dice rolling in those kind of games it's just fan. it's just fantastic that this game doesn't have that it's it just feels like the game is on your side and you know, you're obviously there's challenging missions and you can scale the difficulty depending on what the wounds do, but it never feels unduly unfair. It always feels like we failed because we should have chosen to do something different, not because arbitrarily the game says we failed. The other thing I've found in some other games is that as a character I've been stood there and it will be my turn and it's like, well, I mean I've tapped that, I can't do that, I can't do that, okay, well, uh, I'll just heal and wait until my next turn then um, and I didn't find that that happened in this game no, at all, at all. Um, there was always something you could do and that partly that was to be for, because you're able to put the cards down in the zero slot and then pull them back um, that give you something to do and and partly I think it's because you're managing what you're doing when with where you put things and how the tracks moving that you're always sort of planning ahead as to what you're next going to be able to do that you don't get sort of stuck in a corner like I have in other games. And it's just things like that that seem like really sensible, clever choices from a designer who clearly knows this genre incredibly well. So continuing the accessibility of this game is enemy behaviour. Now, I obviously I'm used to the computer doing all the enemy behavior for me and that was something I always struggle with with kind of tabletop dungeon crawlers because you get a new enemy then you have to find out how they operate and what they do and that's often unique to each individual enemy that's incredibly derailing because suddenly you're taken out of the experience as you flip for a rule book not so in this game all you have to do during the setup is be told which enemy behavior card you're going to place down on the table enemies are divided into red and yellow so on one turn, red enemies will behave, and they'll behave according to the chart. Then, as you progress through the game and take end your turn, you flip the card over, then you've got the behaviours that the yellow enemies are going to perform. So these enemy behaviour cards allow you to predict who's going to respond to your actions on a given turn. If you're looking at a red card, only red enemies are going to react, which means you can get up close and personal with those yellow enemies and know they're not going to attack you this turn. On my character, I had um, an action called Tail Swipe, which meant that I could get up and close to the reds, knowing that they weren't going to attack, which gave me a chance on my next turn to be able to take them both out, leg it or with one of my other actions before they were going to get to react to that. So um, you can plan with how you're positioning, who you need to attack when, who you need to hightail it away from because they're really super fast and going to get you. Um, depending on what the movement is but it does keep you on your toes there are some missions that we did where you start off the mission and they think that you're a mechanic or something just chilling about and then all of a sudden they realize you're up to no good and that enemy behavior card changes to another one so what were originally quite nice friendly enemies suddenly were shooting us <laughs> um, you've then got to work out they were doing that before now they're doing something different how's that going to affect my play style 
And also, more excitingly, as you progress through the game, you even get orange characters who behave, but regardless of whether the card is yellow or in fact red. They're behaving all the time, so you want to keep out an eye on those ones. Now hopefully hearing those points have helped you decide if this game is for you. I for one am going to be backing it on Kickstarter as soon as it launches. Having played and had such great experiences with Mass Effect and being able to share that with someone who hasn't played Mass Effect but plays board games is incredibly exciting. And I think games like this, you talk about the experiences of it. You talk about, we did this. We've already talked about how we made bad decisions and failed missions due to incompetence and how we killed someone or didn't kill someone that we probably should or shouldn't have done. We even had this bit where we led enemies around and took them on a merry dance and you were gunning them down while I was desperately hacking at a computer, which obviously meant I was drawing back on the bag, desperately hoping that on that turn I was going to draw three purples because if I didn't, it was going to be all hell to pay. Being able to talk about those experiences playing a game I think is, is really exciting and that's why I've gravitated towards Dungeon Crawlers as a kind of emerging board game player who's used to video games. If you played any game like XCOM, UFR, Enemy Unknown, obviously Mass Effect, any of those tactical RPGs, this is going to be right up your street and as we've talked about, it's an accessible game. It's not at all an alienating game, despite the awesome alien theme. <laughs> yeah, in terms of tabletop experiences, um, I think any of those dungeon crawling style games, this is going to be a slightly similar experience to. So if you've enjoyed Gloomhaven, Imperial Assault, Descent, you really enjoy Starcadia Quest, mm -hmm. any of those kind of things, I think you're going to really enjoy this experience. And I think it's good value too. Um, um, I believe that it's going to Kickstarter $100, which at the moment translates to about £75 yeah, yeah. Pounds in England. Um, so you're talking about less than £2 per mission if there's going to be 40 of the 70 missions, you're probably going to complete 40 of them to complete the legacy. I mean, £2 for that amount of gaming is... It's great value for great. me. I mean, I mean I've yeah. spent over £100 just on a special collector's edition of Mass Effect alone. So. Um, you're probably going to get a lot of value for this and I don't I don't think anyone's ever going to play it just once. I mean, we've already flicked through the, the campaigns we've played just to see what would be different and because you can choose different characters for a different campaign and change how they're going to be, who which characters they're going to, you're going to play as and also how they're going to behave and what their characteristics are going to be, there's potential you can just play through the whole thing again and just see how these completely opposite characters behave in the same situations. I think that's really exciting. So if you've enjoyed listening to us talk about why we think Rogue Angels is going to be a fun and exciting game, then please like the video and consider subscribing to our channel. If you've got any questions about our experiences playing the game, we'll please put a comment and we'll answer those as best we can. But of course, you have to do that after you've walked on over to Kickstarter to back this incredible game. <laughs>